Uh, my name is uh, Nicola Longo. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I'm also the chief of the division of medical genetics. I started working with uh, fibroid disease and other lysomal steroid disorder more than 30 years ago, and I've been part of several clinical trials to try to bring new therapy to uh, help patients with fibroid disease. What we would like to understand is really if we can not only prevent progression of the disease, but also cause improvement in existing symptoms. The problem is that in general, with this condition and with the therapy that we are currently available, once a diagnosis is made, many times there are irreversible damages to many organs, and those cannot be undone. What is necessary is really early diagnosis and intervention with what we have today. In addition, if we could develop therapies that can reach better all organs, it might help more patients with fibroid disease in getting better, not just not progressing, but getting better from the state in which they start. So first of all, we have to establish a diagnosis, and the diagnosis is uh, usually done by DNA testing and by enzyme assay in males only. In females, enzyme assay is not reliable. What uh, the specific mutation causing fibroid disease can tell us is, uh, number one, as this mutation has been associated with classic fibroid disease or some milder variant of fibroid disease. Keep, keeping in mind that even the milder variants are not really mild, they are still severe. The second thing that we do, we measure what accumulates in fibroid disease. Until a few years ago, we only had one compound which is called GL3. Now we have another one, which is called lysogl 3 which is much more sensitive than GL3, to determine how much storage material is accumulating in patients with fibroid disease. The more you accumulate, the more likely you, have to, uh, you are to have complications of fibroid. Obviously, if we had a, a very effective therapy, we would be able to reduce this accumulation to prevent progression and possibly to start getting additional improvements. First of all, we try to assess all organs. Fibroid disease, uh, it is known to affect the kidneys, and the kidney are the organs that are affected first. But now we know that it affects the heart very much, and the brain as well, causing strokes. So the first thing that we do, we try to assess what is the damage to this organ by uh, blood chemistry and urine chemistry, and also looking at the heart by echo, and most of the time at the brain by MRI. And then we start therapy with enzyme replacement therapy. In febrile disease, patient miss uh, an enzyme, which is called alpha-galactosidase A, and what we do, we produce alpha-galactosidase A in the lab, and uh, the compound that it is, the biological product that it is generated, is then infused to patient every other week by an IV. This is the therapy that basically gives back the enzyme that it is missing in that. Uh, the problem with the therapy is that obviously it is intermittent because you give that every two weeks and it is not always there. In addition, some organs such as the brain, they do not receive much enzyme replacement therapy. There are additional therapies that we do in this patient that are the therapy that we do in patients that have a propensity to stroke. Sometimes we start baby aspirin. Sometimes we start... Uh, clopidogrel. In other cases, we have to use uh, uh, eliquids. Uh, but in general, those are in addition to the enzyme replacement therapy. That it is the causal uh, therapy. 
There is also an approved, an FDA approved medication for patients who have certain mutations in the Fabry gene. There are certain mutations in which giving a small chemical increases the residual enzymatic activity of the mutant enzyme. And that obviously it is very easy to use and very simple. But again, only a minority of patients have this type of mutation. The majority of patients will require lifelong enzyme replacement therapy. So the way that you monitor, obviously, you look at the patient and you see how they are doing in terms of symptoms. And the symptom that the patient had, uh, many times they don't kill them, but very, uh, they cause a lot of problems because the first symptom that males have is pain in the extremities, very severe pain. So severe that many times patients require opioids to treat the pain, especially when they have no idea why they're having the pain. Others have irritable bowel syndrome that can be very problematic. But the organs that we monitor, but those are both conditions that are difficult to monitor using a lab test or imaging. What it is easy, easy to monitor is the kidney function, the cardiac function, and the brain scan, because what we can see is if there are uh, abnormalities at baseline and how they are progressing. In addition, the, uh, in February disease, you have the accumulation of different type of material, one of which is the LISO GL3, and we monitor the level of this compound with time. In general, when we start enzyme replacement therapy, this compound decreases until it's stabilized at a certain level that it is usually above normal, but it is still reduced from the baseline. If we see a spike, then we suspect that there is a problem. Which problem can happen with enzyme replacement therapy? The main problem is the production of antibodies that block, that bind the enzyme and prevents its, its activity. So if that happens, obviously the enzyme does not work anymore and you have worsening of the disease in addition to infusion reaction sometimes. So in other words, you develop uh, some hypersensitivity reaction to the infusion. 